It's a tremendous honor to be standing here tonight, but also an unusually daunting task. I'm going to be guided here by Professor Dani Fisser, our DVC's suggestion that the inaugural lecture, rather than trying to be a showcase of knowledge, should go back to its medieval roots, where it marked what was actually the start of an academic career. And it aimed to put out a set of ideas to be debated. Thank you for joining me tonight. I was presumptuous enough to invite here a wide range of people who mattered to me, and you were kind enough to come. <laughs> if you've come here for answers and solutions, I confess I have few of these, but I'm planning to use the opportunity to pose questions. I think a crucial part of our academic work is le about learning to ask good questions. And personally, I feel myself still to be on the search for the really important questions in the field of education and higher education in particular. These are matters of too much significance for all of us for me to spend this time impressing you with fancy terminology or dropping big academic names. So in this presentation, I, I'm going to also be guided by the advice of my former PhD supervisor, Professor Dick Gunston from Monash University, who said that if you can't explain to your grandmother what your research is about, then you don't really know what you're doing. I have placed further pressure on myself tonight by inviting my special guest of honor, Ms. Letitia Sneeman. She is a leading educator whose work made me think that education was the most important thing in society and that I wanted to be part of that endeavor. She is the retired principal from Rhenish Girls High School in Stellenbosch. In the very constrained space of apartheid schooling in the mid-1980s, Letitia took every opportunity at hand to develop open-minded and critically thinking young girls. In the early 1990s, she steered the school towards becoming one of the first in that sector to embrace a non-racial identity, and on this basis played a central role in the continued building of a remarkably special school. Welcome to Letitia, and thank you for coming. So 17 years ago, I made a decision that would change my life completely. I taught, as you heard, from Francis High School of Physical Science and Maths for two years. I'd recently returned from my MED at the University of Leeds. I think I was looking for a challenge and it arrived in my post box. I was in the mailing list of the Department of Chemical Engineering at UCT since I'd attended their teacher's afternoons, which were instituted by the legendary Professor Cyril O'Connor, who many of you know. They were advertising for something called an Education Development Officer. It seemed an odd position. At that time, I thought of myself only in terms of being a teacher. And it wasn't clear that there was much teaching in the position, which contrasted to another option I had at the time, which was a firm teaching job, also at a tertiary level. So here I'd like to credit the advice of my father, Professor Mike Case, who's also with us tonight. It was maybe the only time in my life that I really listened to his advice. <laughs> He said, quite simply, take the UCT job. Thus began an incredible personal and professional journey, the half of which I could never have imagined in 1996 when I began. The position had a rather vague job description, which initially bothered me, till I realized that this was an opportunity to try and craft something interesting. Academic development at the time largely involved teaching on bridging or extended degree programs, and here, I need to note that UCT then and now have been leaders in this field. UCT Chemical Engineering had done something unusual and created an academic development position within their mainstream program. This work spearheaded by my dear colleague, Professor Duncan Fraser. I, I have spent these nearly 17 years working out how we might do that academic development in the mainstream. And in some respects, I think we're only starting. Every generation has its struggle. This is the slogan of the Equal Education Campaign, an impressive organization whose work I have followed with great interest since its inception. They advocate for quality and equal education for all South Africans, and they have managed a range of highly effective campaigns from on the ground work getting windows fixed and addressing late coming in township schools to the policy level where they've launched impressive legal action to push for minimum norms and standards legislation on schools facilities. Here they are at a protest outside parliament in the early days of the campaign. James and Julia were with me there. 
I'm most honored that Equal Education have given me permission to appropriate this slogan for my own ends today, extending its application into the context of higher education. The good of education may seem self-evident, but I want to restate two things here tonight in the face of a world that seems too easily seduced by shortcuts and glitz. Clearly, if we wish to build the South African economy, we need a much more educated population. We are seriously hampered by our low skills base. We have had 350 years of a view that we could succeed with by properly, properly educating only a small minority of our population, followed by 18 years in which we have yet to see concrete action that significantly changes the status quo. But to sell the goal of education, the main goal as economic prosperity, is to sell it very short. True education goes to the heart of what it is to be human. And here I can't say it better than my housekeeper and our nanny, Mrs. Nonsha Kloswa, also here tonight, who went walking with me into the beautiful buildings of the COSAT school in Kailitsha to see her daughter, MC, at the UCT Schools Initiative launch. Nonsha turned to me and said, you educated people, you really, have your educa you really have your heaven on earth. This was the feeling we both had when we walked into the meticulous grounds of this renowned establishment where even the buildings reflect that sacred quality. As much as we might all share a value of education itself, education research sometimes feels like the SBCA of the university to use a delightful phrase from my former PhD student and colleague, Professor Brandon Collier-Reed. I think he was describing the mechanical engineering department as the SBCA. <laughs> Education research is on the face of it such an odd thing to do. Everyone at the university has something to research. Most people enter the academy because they want to do research. On this point, I want to highlight the recent thesis of another PhD, Dr. Bruce Clute, who explored this area. Everyone has something to teach, and the university and the way that academic careers are structured generally assumes that you don't need any special training or skills to do that. Then you have this crazy bunch of people, many who are sitting here tonight, <laughs> for whom teaching itself is the reason they chose the job at the university. Being good academics, they have to do research, and thus they research their passion, education. I said that this inaugural would be about posing questions, so I want to start with a particularly cheeky question that my husband Roger posed to me. Those of you who know him know that Roger is always good at keeping it real. Thinking particularly of the latter part of the 20th century, where education research really took off, he asked, if there had been no education research anywhere in the world, would schooling today be better or worse off than it currently is? <laughs> now, there are some very strong scholars in our very own School of Education who have produced persuasive evidence on the pitfalls of so-called progressive education movements that have changed school curricula in much of the Western world. With our own context catching up maybe a bit later, but also making sure it didn't miss out on some of the more ill-conceived of those interventions. Of course, we should not make the mistake here of conflating knowledge and action. Even when we try hard, there is a huge gulf between the two. But in this context, a lot of schooling reform was predicated precisely on educational scholarship of the time. Now, I want to be cheeky too and say that there's a lot of activity that goes under the umbrella of education research that at best is unnecessary and at worst is dangerous. One of my master's lecturers at Leeds delighted in showing us a published article which had established with elaborate statistics that pupils who attended schools with swimming pools were more likely to be better swimmers. <laughs> in South Africa today, a staggering 10% of the PhDs we produce annually are in the field of education. I'm not sure what this means, but given that we do so much education research, I think it is maybe a good time to be questioning the value of what we do. I want to, at the outset of this talk then, establish two positions which I think we can use to explain the limited value of much current education research and which can point us in productive new directions. Firstly, thinking about knowledge. 
Research is aimed towards generating knowledge. What is knowledge? Aristotle offers us a typology of three types, episteme, techne, and phronesis. Episteme is the form of knowledge that has driven the extraordinary developments in our modern society. It is science. It is predictive and universal and context independent. Techne, from where we get our term technology, refers to the creation of artifacts. It is pragmatic and context dependent. A further pragmatic and context dependent form of knowledge is phronesis, for which ethics is a poor and limited modern translation. To give a sense of the fuller space in which phronesis operates, let me give you the kind of questions that would drive a search for knowledge that is oriented towards phronesis. Where are we going? Is this desirable? What should be done? It has been argued that the limited value of much contemporary social science is due to its captivation with episteme and its relative undervaluing of phronesis. Never mind techne, I remain convinced that so much of teaching is more art or craft than a science, and that in devaluing this difficult skill, we have done further damage. Secondly, thinking about ontology. Ontology is how we think about the world, what's out there. For much of my research life, I went along with the views that matters of ontology were fun philosophical questions, but not really essential for the social science researcher. More recently, I've been persuaded otherwise. I want to take you very quickly through the basics of a critical realist ontology to demonstrate how this can help frame the search for powerful knowledge. Critical realism has started to take some prominence in social science as a kind of, as, in a way, as a reaction against postmodernism and extreme relativism. So to introduce this ontology, I want to use the metaphor an iceberg. I recognize that an iceberg is a handy modern metaphor used for all sorts of pop psychology. When you want to suggest there's something <coughs> beneath the surface. <laughs> well, I'm going to use it all the same, as much as all metaphors have their limits. We have the iceberg itself, and we can all agree there is an iceberg there, a rather beautiful one at that. The men in the rubber duck also all agree on that. What we can objectively observe is the level of the actual, in critical realist terms. The men in the boat all have their subjective experiences, though, and this is, of course, why any research with people is interesting. <laughs> One of them might have wet socks, and he's struggling to appreciate the iceberg since his feet are cold. The pilot might be concentrating on steering the vessel. The level of subjective experiences is what critical realists term the empirical. Note that these terms have very particular meanings here, not necessarily how you might use them in another context. Of course, what can't be directly observed or subjectively experienced is what lies beneath the surface, and in a way here the metaphor breaks down. For the level of the real is the level of generative mechanisms which produce the events that are both objectively observed and subjectively experienced. It is important to emphasize here that in talking about mechanisms, this does not imply a simple causality, a linear cause and effect. To understand the interaction between different real entities, we need to take account of the phenomenon of emergence. And maybe fortunately for both of us, we don't have time today to go further into that. It's quite tricky. Another conversation. So in terms of education research, particularly in higher education and most especially in science and engineering education, I would argue that our training in science and engineering, for many of us, led us to feel most comfortable with working at the level of the actual. There's a lot of interesting work and important work that can be done at correlating variables at this level. We need to know at a systems level how the system is performing. So here I can present some signally crucial data emerging recently from analysis of the throughput of all the first years we took into our mainstream chemical engineering degree over the first five years of the last decade. Thanks to my colleague Hilton Haydenreff for taking the lead on this work. These objectively observable data tell us a lot about how our system is performing. Overall, we see that only 66% of the students who entered during that time obtained the degree. We need to remember here that the students accepted into this program are at the very top end of the South African matriculant body. This analysis is for those in the mainstream program, and all at this point entered on the same academic criteria. Their international classmates are also top achievers in their countries. 
If we disaggregate the data by date, race, as we've done here, we obtain further very important information, of course, which is the spur for our work in academic development. However, if we want to go in any way into the why questions, we need to do something else. And so an important move for many of us who started doing education research was to explore the world of our students' subjective experiences of education, to move into the zone that the critical realist term empirical. Much of my work over 15 years has been in this domain. An early project with now Professor Jeff Jarvitz sought to unpack the reasons that students gave for choosing engineering. This is my first journal paper, and I see I was still Jenny Case before I went for the more impressive sounding Jennifer M. Case. <laughs> in this study, we found many South African students in the early post-apartheid years stating that they chose engineering because they wanted to help build their communities. Others said that they wanted to make a mark in an area that was traditionally white and male. At that time, there was nothing like this in the international literature. And I've kept alive the question that we posed even then, which wondered what happened to students' aspirations when they actually entered our programs. My PhD work saw me live through second year chemical engineering three years in a row, following students closely to see to what extent they were able to take on board the deep approach to learning that was so clearly needed for success in this program. Around about this time, I met someone who'd also done a close-up qualitative PhD on students' approaches to learning in an engineering program, Professor Delia Marshall from the University of the Western Cape. Thus began what has been one of the most delightful and productive collaborations so far in my academic life, as well as a treasured friendship. Our joint publications in journals and book chapters listed here are testimony to this collaboration. It has been very important for us in this work to establish that the way we define our courses is not the way they are necessarily perceived by students. We have problematized the assumed direct link between our teaching and their learning. But if one sticks at this level, one lands up with findings that are useful to promote empathy with students and maybe to inform more thoughtful teaching, but are limited in taking us beyond that. If we want to start to generate insights, that can help us truly understand the situation we're in and to identify what we need to do to get to a different place, we need to go to the level of the real. Thus, in this talk, I want to put forward some of my current work in which I'm attempting to build a critical realist analysis on student learning using the work of the British sociologist Margaret Archer. This is a part of a UCT Cheminge grad photo. I'm using it to introduce two students whose narratives will frame this talk. This is not their class, but I'm using the image to help you picture the context. The first student is Victor, which is also not his real name. Looking back on the program, some years on, Victor said, you can give me anything at any time. I can handle it. I don't flinch. I've been through hell before. The second student I will call Susan. Looking back, she said, there is a badge of honor in getting through it. I would not have made it without my friends. I spent a year with these students in their third year course on advanced reactor design with an intensive and somewhat crazy commitment to participant observation, where I attended all lectures, worked alongside students in the problem solving tutorial afternoons, did the design project, and even wrote the tests and the exam. While pregnant with my first child, James, during this course, we conducted two individual interviews with each of 36 students who volunteered to participate out of a class of 45. It is a huge pleasure for me to note that the psychologist who conducted the first interview with each student for me is today employed full-time as our faculty psychologist, Ms. Nazima Ahmed. I've spent a lot of time over the last decade now of research work combing back and forth over these interviews and other data collected in that course working towards trying to understand student learning in this context. My analysis of the full set is presented in the book that I'm currently finalizing for publication. Now at this point you may feel cheated. You came to a talk built to give a view on student learning in contemporary South Africa. And right now it has become clear to you that I'm drawing only on data from UCT Chemical Engineering. I thus need to clarify my thinking on what a case study is all about. Of course, is it not generalizable in a statistical sense? 
It is up to you, the audience, to decide on the potential transferability of these findings to your context. Crucially, what the realist analysis should offer is more than a, just a descriptive view, but rather explanatory theory which can show us the interrelations between key dimensions at play in the context of university student learning. So as I said, for the purposes of, oh my word, so what does it mean? It comes up every 15 minutes. Okay, well that's one thing to <laughs> make me move along. Um, right. Thanks, it's also to see if you're actually not sleeping. <laughs> um, so I, I've said I'm going to use the narratives of Victor and Susan to illustrate aspects of my key findings to date. At the time of the third year course, when I first interviewed them, Susan and Victor were located in what we tend to call the top and the bottom of the class, and in that way they almost book in the full set of narratives. Susan is a straight through student and goes on to graduate with first class honours. Victor is in his fifth year of study and takes a further two years to complete the degree. Note of course that in interviewing only students who had made it to the third year of the programme, the invisible bottom is not present, the approximately one third of the intake of students who do not get to this point. Last year I caught up again with Susan and Victor and many of their classmates for follow up interviews. Both of them are now well established in their respective careers. Susan never worked a day as an engineer. She went into management consulting and now specializes in HR. Victor is an operations manager in a minerals processing consulting company that specializes in the design and commissioning of new plants. He manages the plant in its startup phase, monitoring capacities and emissions until it is operating at design capacity and can be handed over to the client. You can already see that these two narratives are going to give us food for thought. Let's go to the very beginning. Susan attended a private girls' school. Although her father was an engineer, she did not initially consider engineering as a career choice. What she described as her two big passions were either to be a chemistry lecturer or a history teacher. But then she attended the local university open day and got chatting to an enthusiastic chemical engineer who persuaded her that this career could actually encompass her passions, well, at least the maths and science, with the added advantage of opening doors. When I catch up with them in third year, Susan has the following to say about her choice of study. The thing is, learning chem -eng is not fun. It really isn't life. It's tons and tons of maths. All you have to do is work. It takes over your whole life. I have all these things as well, which are, they're a part of my life, and they're not... It's just not having time to do, to expand your life in any way, to think outside the chemeng box. Although she generally achieves top marks in her class, she is bothered that she doesn't feel she's able to get anywhere on her own. She always gets stuck and needs to ask for help. She can't see how you could possibly pass these courses if you aren't using the help available in the tutorial sessions. Of this lecturer, she says, I really get a lot out of his lecturing. She appreciates the depth of his knowledge, especially how he's able to explain from first principles how one thing is related to another. She also notes, if you ask stupid questions, he explains them properly. She has a close network of friends and she works regularly out of class with one of them. Victor came from a rural village which had no running water or electricity. His experience of school was characterized throughout by frequent teacher strikes and his final year of school there had been no teachers for most of the year. The students had to prepare that by themselves for the final school examination. And Victor had been one of only four students in his school who had received the level of results qualifying them for admission to the university. His dream had been to study medicine. But when he heard about the marks needed for chemical engineering, which he was achieving, as well as the possibility of sponsorship, he changed plans. He entered UCT through the ASPEC program, but still found the transition a huge shock. He ascribed this to his difficulty in communicating in English. After five years at UCT, he still said he didn't really feel confident in English. The demands of university were also a huge shock to him. He felt he was being pushed. They wanted to, us to keep working on all the time, through the whole semester. Looking back now, he said, this is like my fifth year here. I've seen people come and go, all my friends have got degrees at the moment, and I'm like still not even being close to being able to get a degree. 
Victor said he struggled to make good use of the formal class times. In the lectures, he was annoyed by the one student who asked a lot of questions and seemed to monopolize the lecturer's time. He found this distracting. In tutorials, he often left early and went home to his residence room. He preferred to seek out help on his own and had a wide range of people in the department that he felt comfortable consulting, including a number of graduate students. These were temporary connections which always required him to initiate them. He did not have ongoing, sustained academic connections in the class. He was frustrated by his erratic academic performance and he didn't seem to know what worked for him. In many courses, he would go from good marks in one test to a dismal fail in the next. When a test had gone poorly, he would feel demotivated and struggle to pick himself up and work again. But with regard to this course, the Advanced Reactor Design course, Victor said he really valued the lecturer. He had consulted this lecturer twice in his office during the semester and said he was very helpful, gave good explanations, and made you feel you could make it. Here are the questions I want to pose today in the context of these two illustrative narratives against the backdrop of the full data set, pulling in theory appropriate to the task and working towards tentative answers. If you have been listening to the talk, you will realize that these are phronetic questions in their style. How can we characterize student learning in this context? Do we consider this desirable or would we like to see different student learning outcomes? If we wish to change the outcomes, how would we get there? Now these are not in fact new questions and have been the central focus of what we can call student learning research for some time now. I have mentioned that my own PhD work worked within the area of approaches to learning and I've acknowledged that this research program has been important for shifting lecturers' attention towards the way in which students perceive their context. On the other hand, this has kept the field relatively confined to a particular perspective that derived largely from cognitive psychology and which limited the possibilities for a broader critical engagement with higher education and its social context. My colleague Paul Ashman from Lancaster University argues in his recent book that in failing to account for stru both structure and agency, the explanatory potential of this research program has been limited. Structure and agency, bread and butter for the sociologists, but a relatively new consideration in student learning research. To illustrate the issues at hand, I have here two images of the University of Cape Town. The one on the left foregrounds the students, while the one on the right has an all-imposing institution. In a simplistic way, these could represent accounts of student learning which are either overly agentic or overly structural. Privileged in considerations of agency, we focus only on students and their choice of, for example, an approach to learning. Privileged in structure are accounts which continue to search for the holy grail of the perfect teaching method. At the moment, I think it is problem-based learning. In my current work, I'm drawing on Margaret Archer's theory as a way of conceptualizing student learning that adequately accounts for both structure and agency, mechanisms at the level of the real, by the way. So Archer disaggregates the domain of structure, the world out there, into the twin realms of structure and culture. Structure has to do with material goods, who has got the goodies and who hasn't, is also the domain of social positions and roles and institutions like universities. Culture is the world of ideas and beliefs in Archer's terms. Please note this is different to how other academics might use the term culture. So Archer's culture can be conceptualized as the contents of all the libraries in the world, all possible ways of thinking about ourselves and the world we live in, both in the past and in the present. The university in my pictures here holds both structural and cultural properties. For a full analysis, we need to disentangle these interlocking powers. In the arena of student learning research, we are centrally, centrally focused on the development of student agency. We aim for students to leave higher education with different knowledge and capacity for action than that with which they enter. Student learning research began with interviews with students about their learning. And as much as close-ended inventories later became all the rage, many of us have retained an interest in using interviews as a primary means for generating in-depth contextualized data. Of course, there's always the risk of taking interview data at face value as if this gives a kind of direct route into the student's mind. An interview always results from a social context, a certain kind of contrived conversation, and that also always has to be taken into account in analysis. 
The traditional way of analyzing interview data involves generating a set of categories that characterize the full data set. An alternative methodology, termed narrative analysis, involves taking each narrative on its own terms, with the primary analytical work being to understand the interrelations between different elements of the particular narrative. And it is in this mode that I have used in the analysis that I now present. The focus for the study is on students' experience of learning in chemical engineering at UCT, as, as I have mentioned. And thus, when presenting the narratives with which I started the talk, I defined the beginning as the choice to study engineering. Here we obtain just a glimpse of the idiosyncratic space in which this choice is made. The prospective student's emerging personal identity sees them prioritizing concerns and formulating projects to use Archer's framing of these aspects of what she calls the internal conversation. The structural context in which the student find themselves by virtue of their birth and the life chances that this has afforded constrains and enables the range of choices. Susan can take for granted that she can pick any university program that she likes. She has the matric results to guarantee entry and her parents are able to foot the bill. Victor has achieved the almost unimaginable in his school context and without much teacher assistance has achieved the marks which allow him to consider some of the most prestigious programs on offer, medicine and engineering. But funding is an enormous constraint and engineering offers more possibilities in terms of bursary funding than the alternatives I've mentioned. Archer has introduced the notion of reflexivity to characterize the qualitative differences that can be observed in the way that individuals conduct their internal conversation. What she terms communicative reflexivity involves externalizing the internal conversation with significant others, friends, family, before you embark on a course of action. In this regard, the role of conversations with others in Susan's career choice does seem to suggest aspects of communicative reflexivity. On the other hand, Victor's choice to embark on university studies is a distinct setting apart from his natal context an individually driven choice to rise above his circumstances, and as such fits into what Archer terms autonomous reflexivity. Once they enter the program, they both find themselves in an enormously constrained space. The engineering curriculum operates as the central manifestation of culture and structure. Both Victor and Susan find that the chemical engineering curriculum makes exclusive demands on their time and focus. The pacing is tight and even the students who have the strongest academic backgrounds are struggling to fit it all in. Looking back, Susan described this as a year where there was basically no wriggle room, her delightful phrase. The curriculum is structure, defines what students need to deliver and when, also what resources will be provided in terms of lectures and other class sessions. The chemical engineering curriculum is a sprint and if you trip up, you find yourself back at the starting line in the new year. The curriculum is culture, defines what knowledge matters and what is a legitimate performance by a student in demonstrating their mastery of this knowledge. Central to student learning in higher education is an engagement with knowledge, noted here for its full realist characterization with independent properties and powers. The knowledge in this course I looked at, the Advanced Reactor Design course, is in the broader space of engineering science. It builds on an understanding of fundamentals in earlier chemical engineering science courses, as well as chemistry. Its language is mathematical. We have much research evidence from science education regarding the learning challenges associated with a field like this. And both Susan and Victor experience enormous difficulty in mastering what the course demands of them. Pedagogy, as seen in interactions with the lecturer, operates significantly to either hinder or enable student learning. This course was deliberately chosen as one where the lecturer was generally well regarded. I wanted to understand what actions and orientations were crucial in this regard. Clearly, the interactions with the lecturer were quite central to students' engagements with knowledge in the course. These went well beyond good explanations and in many actions, it was seen that the lecturer made deliberate interventions to facilitate and promote student learning. At the heart of the academic project in chemical engineering is the individual student who has to acquire and demonstrate a newly specialized consciousness. 
However, the means to get there for the vast majority of people rests hugely on interactions with others. Students exercise what Archer terms corporate agency through their engagement with their peers in order to facilitate their achievement of academic success. These interactions, though, are also constrained, particularly by the demographic markers of primary agency. Here, Victor found himself at a distinct disadvantage. As noted earlier, he had no ongoing support network in an academic sense. On the contrary, Susan had a tight friendship circle with whom she had worked academically since first year. I spent one tutorial afternoon in the group with Susan and her friends. The three girls worked together closely and productively, with two of the guys lagging behind and a bit more distracted. <laughs> I spent another afternoon with Victor's group. There was a long period at the start of the tutorial where no one, including me, could make any progress, and the conversation was all social while they waited for a tutor to attend on their query. When the tutor did arrive, the input did not assist anyone in making substantial progress, and a number of students, including Victor, left shortly thereafter. These results resonate with those in the PhD thesis of my former research student, Dr. Linda Cotter, in which she found that the ability to mobilize peer networks was the crucial determining success factor for students who were doing chemical engineering design in the senior years of the program. In her study, she noted that black students in general did not manage to mobilize these resources in the same way and as productively as did white students. Corporate agency where students work together to enhance their individual prospects for success is an aspect of what Archer terms social identity. At a completely different level is the social actor, one who is able to personify a role in a particular way which gives full expression to their personal identity. Very few of the students in this study were noted to have achieved social, social identity in this full sense of also being a social actor. Largely, the constraints imposed by the curriculum left very little space for this kind of development. So what? <laughs> the realist analysis which I'm developing shows that none of the observed student learning outcomes in our programs can be considered a matter of historical accident. Highly sophisticated systems have evolved which have particular outcomes. Those students who do graduate, even those who take more than the regular time to achieve this end, go on to have successful careers in South Africa and abroad, some directly in the field in which they studied, like Victor, and others, like Susan, going on to build further expertise in a completely different area. These graduates seem to overcome whatever might have been the limitations of a university experience which didn't allow for much more than intense academic focus, and for many, significant experience of failure. On this latter point, we do, however, need to note the costs of such a system. What does it mean for the individual like Victor who ends up taking seven years over a four-year degree? A significant proportion of students also spend years in the program and never graduate at massive costs to themselves and to society. What does it mean for South African University to note that these experiences remain highly associated with race? We need to recognize the inherent structural and cultural constraints on students achieving success in a tertiary program of study. Knowledge with its own causal powers and property, as I have noted earlier, is central to the academic endeavor. Student success has to be a measure of students' ability to produce what we can call legitimate text in a given academic space. What is legitimate is determined not only by academics who run the program, but by the disciplinary community. A simplistic assessment of the situation at hand would suggest something like the following. The regulation program is failing the majority of its students, thus either it should be made easier or more time should be allocated to allow students to master the necessary work. There are a number of problems with this position, not least of which that it takes the current outcomes of the program for granted. Fundamentally, it plays into credentialism, which sees the value of the degree in instrumental terms focused on a piece of paper. Working from a normative position, which argues for the significance of higher education for building a more socially and environmentally just society, and the special role of professionals in building that society, we need to take a number of steps backwards. Considering the development of student agency, we note that the 
space for student growth and action in this program, for example, is extremely limited. The curriculum specifies a close-ended engagement with knowledge, and students need to stick closely to a specified series of course tasks and demands if they are to succeed. Crucially, when graduates are out in the workplace, the significance of the degree is asserted in terms that it gave them the confidence to face anything. They can come across as highly self-actualized professionals, but they are not able to point to the value of the advanced knowledge in the program or their engagement with it. They are mainly able to state that they survived. <laughs> there is no doubt that this group are individually playing highly effective roles in society, and I have to say it was a great delight starting the process of follow-up interviews with these students. But the role of the undergrad program in these students' development seems largely limited to learning to work hard and survive. Thus, I want to suggest that we should try to envisage a university program with a significantly enlarged space for the development of student agency. If the program is to do more than simply sift out those students who have the resources to cope with rapid work demands, then it needs to take on the role of allowing students through a deep engagement with knowledge to develop into the kind of professionals that are needed in the 21st century. The poor success rates in this program and in others elsewhere need to be seen as symptoms of a deeper problem, not as the problem in themselves. And this is the value of a realist analysis. Here I need to alert against some dangerous potential misconceptions. Centering knowledge as the focus for higher education does not imply a narrow intellectual quest. The view developed here on the development of student agency sees the engagement with knowledge as quite central to student being and becoming. These are not polar opposites. Indeed, to privilege knowing over being or being over knowing is to make an ontological move that is not really supported by Archer's model of human agency, which in fact centers on knowledge and reflexivity, which work closely in partnership around the developing personal identity and social identity of the student. Now, building an undergraduate program which will allow for these sorts of outcomes will require relatively significant structural and cultural change. It would involve moving away from a model of survival of the fittest towards an assumption that most students who are selected for the program are expected to succeed, and that they will do so through an intense engagement with themselves, others, and with disciplinary knowledge. The structural constraints of knowledge which I think I've mentioned about every fourth paragraph, but this is serious, means that these will continue to be demanding programs, but they will be demanding in quite a different way. Rather than jumping through highly specified hoops and hurdles well suited to the thoroughbreds, it will require a changing of oneself and a building of radically new perspectives on the world. The cost of any significant improvement in su student success in the program will mean that the reputation of its graduates, which derives at least in part from their having survived this program in a context where many do not, would need to find another base. Thus, a change in the overall success for students in a program would involve a significant cultural change for all. Can the program change to achieve better outcomes for more students and still retain its strong reputation? has to be a central question for us. Culturally, the very success of its current graduates has to be an enormous constraint on implementing any change in the system. The situational logic is robust, and neither industries, the, the interests of the academy or industry would like to see any real challenge to the guarantee that the graduate is one of a small group of survivors of an exceptionally rigorous program. That white students tend to succeed differentially in this program is at the end of the day just an inconvenient truth for many. In looking forward, the analysis presented here points to the need for an enlargement of the possibilities for the exercising and development of student agency in higher education. What has been put forward here is really a revisioning of the goals of the program as a true higher education, and thus a link to a broader argument in which the crucial importance of higher education for the building of broad social well-being and environmental sustainability and not just economic development can be asserted. In closing, I want to get practical. 
You may or may not have been impressed by my engagement with sociological theory, but what am I really saying? What practically should we be doing within the very real constraints experienced by a publicly funded South African university in the 21st century? There are a number of things that we have already implemented in our undergraduate chemical engineering program that I think have really started a move in the right direction, and I will briefly mention some of these. We have to make teaching a central part of our work as academics, and we need to recognize that teaching is an art, a craft. One is always building the skill. In my own teaching in first and second year, I have enjoyed the ongoing challenge of developing a pedagogy that can make student learning possible. Here is a photo from the early days, which shows quite how much the process has aged me. <laughs> <laughs> Lectures are a bit out of fashion these days of often misguided student-centeredness. But lectures can be more effective than anything else in opening up a subject for students. They lay out a conceptual map. Crucially, students need to link back to what they already know. And so an obvious starting point is to ask questions to help them make their links. Then students need to try out their emerging understanding. And here I put on a bit of pressure, getting students to individually work on short problems while I walk around and see what they are doing. This is obvious stuff but not sufficiently widespread in lecturing in the university. The most exciting thing I've done in all my years of teaching is lecture casting, where we record the dynamic board work, synchronized with the audio of the lecture, and we post these MP4s to a course website. And no, the lecture attendance doesn't go down. <laughs> there are many potential benefits of this move. Centrally for me, it allows a for students to be able to do a careful review of key aspects of the lecture, particularly for students for whom the English verbal delivery of the lecture feels too fast. We have built into the first and second years of our program a number of initiatives to try to build what I've been terming here corporate agency among students, the building of productive peer networks. We take our first years on a weekend camp. We also run a week-long field trip with our second years, where a group of about 12 students goes with one lecturer to an industrial site. And here we are at the Cape Town Sewerage Works, <laughs> which was much more fun than you would think. <laughs> of course, this field trip is centrally focused towards industrial exposure, but it has this added spin-off of students getting to live together for a week with classmates that they might not have known before, as well as connecting with the lecturer in a different way. We have a fantastic peer mentoring program in chemical engineering, and here we can take only a little bit of credit because its success lies in the amazing enthusiasm and careful skill of our senior students who take on the voluntary work of mentoring first years. Our most recent academic development intervention in the program is aimed directly at the notorious third year, which was my focus above. We have just completed the running of ChemEng Boot Camp during the vacation, in which students who had failed the first semester examination in either of two demanding courses, spent three weeks in the vacation under the guidance and tutoring of a highly skilled postgraduate students, preparing for a rewrite of the examination which took place on the last day of the vacation. The final evaluation of this initiative will of course depend on the examination results, which are not yet available, but all other indications to date are that the intervention was a great success. In fact, most of the photos I've used in this talk uh, we're actually taken at boot camp, and I think you've got a sense of the intensity of that experience. Which leads me to my final point. I think that in some regards, we've reached the limitations of what we can do within the current structure that we have. To this end, we have been working for four years now in conceptualizing in detail in a new undergraduate curriculum. We want a program that more carefully grants chemical engineering with cons within considerations of sustainability, and we want to provide more elective space to allow for students to at least partly craft their own areas of interest and expertise. Next year, we roll out a new first year course to trial many of the structural aspects of the new curriculum, which is envisaged to have one full year chemical engineering course in each of the years. We are planning a, more, a coherent strand of project work running from the start of first year to the end of final year, more systematically to build the different engagement with knowledge that is needed, for example, in design. 
Crucially, we will run regular assessment events throughout these courses with a boot camp in the middle of the year to allow a catch up for those who might not be on track and a further boot camp at the end of the year to allow preparation for any needed rewrites of the final examinations. In this way, very ambitiously, we want to allow for students to use more of the calendar year to work towards success in the program. And we want to significantly increase the number of students who can complete in regulation time. Watch this space. Thank <laughs> you.